any principled reason why inherent tax should be something uh, uh, shouldn't be something that exists in a completely 100% uh, situation. Second of all, we think that not having it um, is a that having it is a major hamper to social mobility, and ultimately could be a really good mechanism for changing the incentive structures of the wealthy in terms of their political aims. And third of all, we think that it misses out a large number of economic benefits. So how are we going to do this? We say basically it's 100% inherent, inherent tax. It's in the motion. We say that that probably means like we will take all of your cash, we will take all of your capital, we will take your property, and we are very likely as the government to redirect that into things such as social programs, such as better education, such as as, uh, better welfare, things that overall benefit wider society. We also say that we deserve the right to prosecute those that have attempted to hide wealth and to prosecute the families of those people who attempt to hide wealth abroad and things like that. We think that's probably enough of a disincentive. Okay, so first of all, principally, why don't we see that like the dead have any rights over like what over like what happens to their money after this? So first of all, we see that say that we like don't think that they have those kind of rights. And we say even the very minor cases where they might, that right does still not take prior priority over the situation and the situation in life and to, to enjoy greater advantages. So why don't they have rights? First of all, we say at the point at which someone who is dead is no longer able to self-actualize, they basically no longer exist and are unable to avail themselves of those kind of rights or those kinds of preferences. They can no longer be harmed by the fact that those preferences are not followed and we say that that's fine. We also say the extent to which we do respect the rights of the dead in society is to reassure the living that their dignity will be somewhat respected. We say at the point at which wealth is something that is very different from any other aspect of identity. We say that wealth is something that is just very material. It is something which is not as important as things such as like religious identity and respecting that. We say the wealth, once you're dead, is no longer an element of your dignity, whereas your religion, because you believe in an afterlife, is something that is an element of your dignity, and therefore the two are entirely different situations. We also say that, like, uh, we also say at the point at which people have very often accumulated large amounts of wealth, they're able to leave an inheritance tax uh, in, 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 without inheritance tax. It's often been because they've gained through their position in society, because they have capitalized on workers in society, such as workers, such as simply benefiting from the education system, from the institutions which we interact with. We say at the point at which they do that, they have some degree of like owing to those institutions. We say at the point at which you've lived out your whole life, can no longer benefit from that wealth. It probably makes moral and, and principled sense to provide all of that money back into the system which allowed you to accumulate that wealth. Okay, so second of all, like so why a dead person's rights cannot be more important than those of the living. We say the dead people can't feel the benefits of this hugely untapped resource um, which which we currently are not available. For example, we say that instead of wealth, going to send your like already posh advantaged grandkid to a really fancy school, a really fancy private school, would probably be better directed or met and um, going into perhaps bettering the state school system, helping to improve the lives of more vulnerable people across the board. We say that's probably a better use of that money with which more people are able to benefit from it and it does more good on the utilitarian calculus. We fully support the idea that this kind of money is better able going into social programs such as welfare, such as the NHS, to benefit the whole of society. I would like to hear a reason as to why a benefit to society is not better than a benefit to an individual that can't even actualize of it. Um, Closing. So the argument you just gave is the reason we already tax this money while people are alive. Why is it then principally legitimate to tax that money again once the state has already laid its claim on it? Okay, so it's not double taxing, right? You're dead. You literally cannot avail of the benefits of the taxing that has occurred, right? The reason that you tax someone is so that they can benefit from it. You said the point at which you're dead, you're dead, you've already gone through that whole process and it no longer applies. We said that like in this way, you're like not complete, you're in, by doing these kind of things, you may not be completely fixing the kind of wealthy starter advantage exists. We say that there are still obviously some systematic preferences towards the wealthy at the point at which you probably have like family connections or you have like some better like lower darn skilling. We say though that the point that this, that this process actually does help to somewhat level the playing field in terms of the starter advantage that exists at the point at which A, people, people who are more vulnerable actually have more um, access to better education, things like that with the money, but also at the point at which some people like, such as wealthy children who just inherit a vast amount of money, money and don't do anything with it, don't have a principal right to it, but also that that thing can be spent on giving them a disproportionate advantage over others even more than they already have.
We say that's probably a net good because it allows more people to be able to climb the social mobility ladder. It means that you have more people having access to better education, better jobs, probably a good thing. We also say in terms of adjusting the political incentives of the wealthy of the society, we say at the point at which you as a wealthy person know that, you're, that all of your money is not going to be, be able to immediately go to your children or to your grandchildren. You have an incentive to um, be more politically aware and more politically pro good things such as social programs, things that help the vast majority of society as opposed to just your individual class because you can no longer guarantee that your child, that your grandkid, or that your great grandkid will remain within that tax because you are no longer able to guarantee that that wealth stays within that family. We say at the point at which you change this kind of voter base, you're far better able to uh, have the kind of political capital necessary to pass these kind of reforms that are best able to benefit all of society and not just the wealthy. Okay, so third of all, what do we get in terms of the kind of economic benefits we can get from this? So first of all, we just say that like spreading wealth is something that is a generally good idea in terms of helping an economy. We say it means that you have a more productive society at the point at which everyone probably has is better able to be able to better standard of living. They're probably more likely to have things such as more leisure time and probably better able to spend money. We also say at the point at which money is better spread, the economy is more stable and more diverse. That allows you to be able to be better coping with shocks in the economy, things like that. Just general good economics that Lewis will explain further. Second of all, we say at the point at which you as you know uh, towards the end of your life that your money is going to be taken from you, you're far more likely to uh, try and spend it within society, you're far more likely to have people stimulating the economy in that way, at the point at which they're able to like go out, buy more things when previously too much money is just locked away in a bank account, unable to do anything to assist society, or unable to stimulate certain areas of the economy. We say at the point at which you're able to do that, you're better able to actually accrue good benefits from the money that previously just sits away. So because like the dead have no rights to have this money because we can better help vulnerable individuals with that money and the wealthy shouldn't just have a disproportionate advantage that we should probably try and try and lessen and because we ultimately help the economy overall we beg you to propose <laughs> Three things from Belgrade today. One morality argument, why we think people have the right to decide what's going to happen with their stuff after they die. And two, we're going to talk about efficiency and why we think this is not going to be economically efficient. Three, we're going to talk about how inequality is actually not going to be solved. Before that, a couple of points of rebuttal that don't really fit in. One, at the end of the speech, the Prime Minister says that she believes that now people are going to be most socially responsible and they're going to invest money in social businesses. That, that's not necessarily accurate, neither they have provided us with a proof of that. Maybe they're just going to spend on parties, yachts, and try to have as much money spent on themselves and their children while they're alive, given that they know that the state will take everything from them. We think that they're even less likely to invest in the state, given that the state is taking away something from them for which they believe belongs to them. Second thing, we also think that it's much better when you have both individuals and the state allocating resources rather than when you have exclusively the state. Because we think that often state may not be the best possible stakeholder uh, to, to reallocate resources. Let's give four reasons for that. One, we believe that state does not always have perfect information and doesn't know which areas are actually the most needed. Secondly, state is also often self-interested and it's looking how to allocate resources in order to benefit. Three, state is not profit incentivized, which is something which makes you be more efficient because you're profit incentivized, unlike the state isn't. And four, there is no accountability which can have on the state because it's quite hard to hold bureaucracy accountable. That is why we think that it shouldn't be exclusively and only the state deciding on this. Also, they talk about identity and they say money is irrelevant. We beg to differ because we think that every single individual has the right to decide which part of their identity is relevant. Some people think that their nation is important. Some people think that it's religion. Some people think that it's actually money. So we don't think why opening government thinks that they have the right to say which part of my identity is more or less relevant to me. Also, what we want to say is that most of the goals that opening government is talking about in this debate can be achieved with a radical redistribution rather than taking everything from you. You're perfectly fine with having radical redistribution uh, in general on rich people. We're okay with having, let's say, UK tax system on inheritance. We think that the US is too low. We think Scandinavian is probably too high. So, for instance, that can be one of the ways how you can solve it. Also, let's talk about all the social benefits they talk about we're going to have. Note that if this motion goes through, you're going to have many houses on the market left that no one is going to be willing to buy them because they're going to be, they are going to be extremely cheap, but no one would want to buy them given that they will be aware of the fact that in 30 or 40 years they're most likely going to lose their houses, so they will rather than that rent a house, live in it, and move on. But also, 
let's say that even if they decide to buy it, the problem is that the prices are going to be so cheap because those houses are just going to be so many of them that the amount of money that we're going to actually get is going to be fewer than the one that we would get from the radical redistribution. Also, up until the point where someone actually buys those houses, someone needs to maintain those houses and service those houses, which are also additional costs that we're going to have on the market. Let's go into our constructive material. Why? Why we believe that people have rights? We think that people have the rights to decide what it's going to do with their stuff even after they die. We think that, for instance, you have the ownership of your body, which is respected even after you die. That's why we don't take your organs up until a point where we get your consent. That's why we bury you in a way in which you want. That is why necrophilia is bad. We think that your property and things you own are an extension of your body because everything that you own was created by your body and by your own work and everything that you have done so far. Yes, we do admit what the government is going to say. To a certain extent, society did contribute to everything that you have. But that means that only part of it, to which extent we believe society has helped you, should be taxed. But at least some parts of the things that you own, irrespective of your social background, are created by you. Because one, you had to put some effort in it, but two, there are many people coming from rich social backgrounds that don't accumulate more capital during their life, which effectively proves that there is a part of you that participated in that creation. Same way as your body is allowed to continue after that, to, exist in a way in which you want, we think that the extension of it has the right to continue. Let's talk about the second thing, which is the use the use of capital accumulation for that, yes. So why doesn't my responsibility for crimes also accrue to my kids? What? Like, if I commit a crime and then I die, why doesn't that responsibility go to my kids as well? Why does it go to your kids as well? Why does it go? Because that is something that I have individually done by myself. While on the other hand, and, and, and also it is something that created a harm. While on the other hand, this is something that is just exclusively mine and I get to decide what am I going to do with it. I don't think that there is a similarity between committing a crime and having money. Use of, the, uh, use of the capital accumulation. We think that this is going to destroy housing market. We think that this is going to lead to many houses being left outside. We think that that's going to lead to prices going down. When they become cheap, as I said in my rebuttal, no one would actually be willing to build those houses anymore. No one would be willing to create those houses anymore. Also, those houses will have, will cost money for us. Also, we think that when people are not going to be able to get the houses, we're going to have the population growth. So we think that we're going to have a lot of people without an incentive to build houses, and it is questionable where all of those new people that are to be born are going to live in. Also, one more very important thing is that we think that taking credits and loans from banks is something which actually is quite helpful for you, but that's going to be much harder right now. Because one, you're not probably going to have a house which is going to be a mortgage when you want to take a loan. But secondly, we also often think that middle class actually takes loans from banks in order to buy a house that they want to keep, which is going to continue the growth of their entire family. Now they're not going to have an incentive to do that because they will be aware of the fact that if they take a loan to buy a house, they're not going to have that house. They're not going to be able to have that house going to their kids. And that's how we reach the third and most important thing in this debate, which we think that it's actually inequality. We think that other, firstly, other things are still going to be important and you still have an inequality in society. Race, gender, beauty, many other things. We think that comparatively those things are much worse than whether or not you're wealthy because your race, your gender, or, or your beauty, it's not something that you have worked for. It is something that you just gain by the purity of birth. Why wealth is something that you have worked on. So we think that's the first level of inequality that stays, but it's based on much worse criteria. Second thing, we don't think this policy is actually going to hit the richest people. Why? Firstly, because networking will still exist. Rich people will still be in elitistic circles and their kids will have an access to those elitistic circles while kids coming from a poorer background are still not going to have an access to this. But also, we think that like many extremely, extremely, extremely rich people already provide their kids well, up until a point where they're 18 with their house and with a lot of money. So those rich kids will still be safe. But what is the problem? The problem is the middle class because the middle class growth happens when a father buys a house and then that house is left to the son and then the son starts starts working and then he gets a bigger house and then he gets another house. Those are the things that are happening, but those things need inheritance. Because effectively, if you're taking everything from me, even when I come from a middle, back, middle class background, that means that I can't continue what my parents have started and accumulate everything that they have started and then create more and contribute more and go from a lower middle class position to a higher middle class position. Which means that effectively, the rich kids are still going to get their benefits up until a point where they're 18 or 19. But the question is what happens with kids coming from a, a poorer background who have no network and who also have no ability to accumulate things from their parents, invest in things even more, and then continue their growth. So basically, what we bring to you is that one, on principle level, we think that people have the right to decide what they want to do with the extension of their body and with what they have created. We have no problem with taxing it because we believe that society did contribute quite
quite a lot to all of those things. We also think that this is not going to be efficient because it's going to create a housing market issue, which we think obviously can be very problematic for the economy. In the end, we think that the, the stakeholder that is going to be hit the most, it's actually the middle class for whose growth open government and closing government are fighting here today. For all these reasons, proud to vote. <laughs> Thank you, Speaker. So we say in this about this is very simple. That the majority of people who live within society accumulating large sums of wealth and money is never going to be an achievable thing they can do in their life. Instead, what happens is the very wealthy are able to entrench that power by passing on not only their assets, not only their wealth, but their knowledge to their children in a pernicious way that is, 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 is not being prevented. On this advice, we bring you two things. First of all, we talk about the principal case, where we think that first of all, it's principal to do this. We're actually going to talk a lot about the land and everything that lands in a really important part of this debate, particularly when you look at the housing crisis that's happening across Europe uh, and, 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 and how mortgages in particular are very bad ways to accumulate wealth. And third of all, how we think we get better social outcomes in our society, not only for the economy, but the, the breakdown of class divides, class warfare, and better apathy between classes. First of all, a few points of extraneous blood bottle that don't quite fit into that model. So we get a few in closing. Closing tell you that this is double tap. So first of all, we say this. At the point that you accept that taxation in general is principled, you accept that people have to give something back to society. We say there's no distinction there between taxing some of the points which they are dead and the points which they are alive. We say that crucially, there's no use to anyone to holding large sums of money in trust that can't be used. We think that the problem is that large amounts of wealth are accumulated at the top end of the spectrum, and that it's never reinvested back in the economy because people simply don't have enough money that you can spend in their lifetime. Second, I would say this: if this incentivizes people to go out and spend large sums of money before they die, even if it is on things that are classified as being frivolous, like boats or yachts or parties, you still think this is a net benefit to the economy. I think the problem is when people don't spend money, like the, 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 the wealthy people, they concentrate in, 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 those, in those sectors. You don't reinvest it back into that economy. You think when you start to spend money, you create services, you create jobs around that spending. We think that it's probable, however, people won't have the opportunity to spend large sums of money. It's actually about passing on other things like land and property, which we're going to go on to. We say that realistically, if people don't approach, so they, they tell you as well, the government's not best place to decide where this money is spent. Think, crucially, we live in democracies where people are able to look at what the tax policy and the spending policy of the government are and choose to vote for different parties or different people. They don't think the money is being reallocated in the correct way. We think we can therefore use the bureaucratic structures to our advantage within this case. Okay, so first of all, then housing, why I think this is really important. So we think there's a massive problem within particularly Western countries as to the allocation of housing and the allocation of resources. We think that lots of people at the point at which they die have large, large like amounts of land, which they either have massive houses on, or they have large large parts of land known as brownfield sites in inner cities which are not being developed upon. They tell you the house prices will massively drop into this policy. We say that that's possibly true, and if it is great, why? Because first of all, housing is extremely expensive under the status quo. We see gentrification in places like London where people are forced out of their houses and forced out of their properties due to the fact they can't sustain sustain their living. We think that the problem is not that the, the, the housing is not readily available or land to build housing is not readily available, is that there's always going to be an advantage to leaving sites underdeveloped under the status quo. We say the wealthy pass down land and, and they choose not to develop upon it because they can, they can uh, do just like rent controls and pricing, they can charge you more for the land they're already selling. And the point is, you, you control the land, you're able to decide how much you charge people to hold that land. The difference is that when the state can reclaim that land, if you just develop in different things, you can then start, you can then decide better pricing metrics and, and, and build better, 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 better social housing for all. They also say it's incredibly problematic for the middle classes. First of all, we say that investing in housing as a way of accumulating wealth is incredibly risky. Why? Well, first of all, normal people, particularly middle class people, have very little control over the cost of housing in terms of the, in, in terms of the entire country. We think that realistically, price signals are out of the control of the individual. You're massively affected by, first of all, the general outcome of the economy, but second of all, things like foreclosures and houses in your streets, the people living beside you, or like government projects to build factories near your house, massively devalue the price of that property. We think, therefore, it's a massive risk for the middle classes to invest all of their assets into a property, given the fact they can end up with negative equity. We think often people leave their children with negative equity, which is incredibly damaging the points which they can't invest. We think, therefore, given that you're massively affected by this, it's actually when on our side of the house, when we can take away that, take away that price signaling and make it better. We think on our side of the house, there is literally no incentive for the wealthy to do anything to address these problems, such as social housing, at the point to which they can accumulate vast sums of capital as a result. We think the point is you, you can address that, you start to make that balance. Right, right, right. First, okay, so, principally why we think we're, we're legitimate in this. So, first of all, 
And the reality is the wealth gap is ever expanding. Despite the fact we've had a, we've had a financial crisis, the rich are still benefiting and the poor are still getting poorer. We think that realistically, the poorest suffer disproportionately most from the decisions of, 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 of the wealthy. Despite the fact the financial crisis happened and it was like, you could argue, the forces of like rich bankers selling something mortgages, realistically, people that had that much wealth were not as affected nearly as drastically by people in the lower, in, in the lower spectrum. We think, therefore, it's principally, principally legitimate to start to redistribute that wealth. We say the point at which it's impossible to reach, those, reach that higher echelon, you have to do something to redress that balance. balance. So first we say this, that there's massive apathy that exists between different classes within society. That has several harms. Then first of all, the, the pe people in the lower, in the lower uh, social economic spectrum blame, the, blame people in the, in, in, in the upper spectrum for, for a lot, for a lot lots of, the, lots of the problems that they have within society. I think that class conflict is incredibly, uh, incredibly, incredibly damaging. Okay, two seconds. We also think as well, crucially, that if you look, look across the world spectrum, societies that are more equal, say the Nordic countries, are far happier by net than countries that, are, that have more absolute wealth. And we think that's important. Yeah, actually, go for it. If I lived in a nice house under your model, why would I not sign over ownership of that to my 18 year old child when I'm like around 40 and just keep living in that house? Okay, so we'd say that, we'd say that comparatively, that can happen on both sides of this house. But on our side of the house, you are far less likely to be able to do things like that. So even, even, if, that is, even if that's possible, we certainly get more, more benefits on our side of the house due to this policy than you get otherwise. We also think as well, what's really important is you have to change the social consciousness of people. We think when things are, are accepted by the status quo as being the way that individuals are expected to act, i.e. you're expected to pass on money to your, to your, to your, to your children if you're very wealthy, that is the kind of thing that, the, that people from upper classes or uh, higher classes are always going to do. We think when you start to change that social calculus, you're far more likely to get buy-in to that system. We'll talk about buy-in in a second. We also think as well, crucially, right, we think that you're still going to have lots of benefits from being wealthy. I think the reason we allow people in a capitalist system to accrue large sums of money is because we accept that some people are either more talented or able to contribute more to society. We think the difference here is, is that the fact that you have contributed more to society than someone else has, has no reflection upon whether or not your children are going to contribute more to society than you did. We think the reason why you're looking to keep sums of money and have a higher, higher standard of living is the fact they have contributed more. We think the point is that you die, your children have not been directly responsible for that link. They have no moral claim to that policy. Again, see the PY from closing, but passing on other things which we, which we don't accept as, as problematic. We think crucially, right, the point at which you make it, you incentive, you, you, the point at which people who are, who are from the upper classes realise that their children are not guaranteed to have the same standard of living as they are because they can pass on large sums of money, that's when you start to get buy into social programmes. Why? Because they accept that they can't simply just pass on wealth and guarantee a certain standard of living for their children. They accept that they're going to rely way, they have the potential to rely way more than ever before on national services like the NHS, National Health Service, like, like, uh, like general tax breaks, like social housing. Because that means that students, students that offer classes tend to have more political say than people in, in, in mid, middle or lower classes. You're far more likely to have pressure put upon governments to implement policies that are far more socially progressive in order to guarantee the future of their children. I think people care more about the future of their children than anything else given the point to which they are parents. We think realistically, the only way to really achieve wealth equally is to do this. We think that you, you still get, you still get, you can still accrue benefit from being, being, uh, being more useful. And for those reasons, I strongly urge you to It is probably not sufficient rebuttal to Helena's claim about how the state is chronically inefficient at the redistribution, redistribution of resources to just say, we live in democracies. True, you vote for governments, but you never vote for people who work in your local tax office. You never vote for people who sit like bureaucrats in Brussels. A lot of these people have power, firstly because they are largely unelected, because they are often in positions where no matter how good or bad a job they do, they will still earn the exact same wages. Certainly, democracy because they often have their own interests, like the increase increasement of more people getting hired there by increasing their own work, so they feel they are important and the state has to keep them. Often, they are inefficient at just redistributing wealth and just asserting we will have more redistribution without giving any analysis does not mean you will have more meaningful welfare on your side of the house. Especially if we look at things like what are the things you will get here. So, if you look at things like very very liquid things, so like m money, simple money, or bank accounts, people will usually think about those when they get old, and plus that usually ends up 
and say things which aren't as liquid, like houses, like financial instruments. What often ha will happen is you have a state stuck with thousands and thousands of houses which you simply cannot sell. You cannot just redistribute houses to people and imagine that will become necessarily wealthy. You will have huge problems regarding that on your side of the house, especially with the incentives that change. So in the status quo, when people pay high levels of inheritance tax, they, still, they pay them because it's still lower than the market price. So if they pay 60% of the, the house in cash, that's 60% of money that's useful for the state to afterwards redistribute. But if it's a 100% inheritance tax, I don't have an incentive to pay it, especially when I know other people will die and houses will become even, even cheaper, which means you have a deflationary market. But what happens is that the state ends up with, say, more houses, but it ends with less money which you can redistribute. You cannot put houses in the NHS and make the NHS better, Madam Chair. So, but they, then where they say people will care more about things in society like the healthcare system. We think it's unlikely. Firstly, if they want to spend money, they'll probably just spend it on some extravagant things towards the end of their life. Take a trip around the world, as Helena tells you. But it's even more likely they'll do other things. So instead of, say, spending more on improving the NHS, you'll probably be just more likely to pay for a policy of private insurance for your own kids before you die, because that brings a greater, a greater benefit for the same amount of money for them. No, thank you. Then we get a POI from closing, which is why don't you, why are you not responsible for crimes after you die? Same as while you're alive. So if I say come and hit you, that's something I will be punished for. But if I want to come and give you 100 euros, they'll just make me a somewhat strange, but probably very nice person. You are allowed to give benefits to other people, but you are not allowed to give them specific crimes, or to specific harm. That's why your children are not responsible for your crimes, but they can still benefit from some of the things which you did. And why is that? Because we recognize that people's rights extend from their life, but also from their body. So that's why you have a right to the property itself. But we also recognize some principles, not only after you die, as Helena points out, but we also recognize unique principles in relation to family. So unique obligations you have towards them when you're alive. But we also recognize there are unique interests between the family and yourself. The fact that my family is the one who decides whether you turn me off machines in case I'm in a coma. The reason why that is, is because there are unique interests between the family and other individuals, and that's why we recognize them on our side of the house. Closing. So if my rights are an extension of my body, why am I not entitled to use my body to the fullest extent and beat you up and take your money in order to further my thoughts? Because that's harming the integrity of my own body. If you are only free to use your body to the extent you, you don't harm the body of others. Or more simply put, the harm principle. That's what we're standing for on this side of the house. But the, the crucial analysis, which they disregard, is about the creation of the middle class. So firstly, this dissuades the creation of small and medium enterprises, which is something that a lot of people who are aspiring middle class members do. So like, I have a house. Because a lot of people are buying houses, and houses are continuously built, generally house prices rise continuously throughout the last 50 or 100 years, which are drops and shocks. That means that all people in the middle class have incentive to buy houses, because they are aware they were increased in value at one moment. Why is that beneficial? Because an increase in the value of your house enables you to take a mortgage, which often enables you to take to start, say, to start a business, say, to start a car, to buy a car, which will enable you to go to work somewhere further away from your home, which is ultimately very beneficial for the creation of the kind of capital you can later give to your children. Let's compare this with the very riches, the one they, these guys are mostly fighting against. So firstly, if you look at the very riches, they're the most likely one to have private health insurance or private life insurance because they have the levels of disposable income in the status quo. Secondly, they can already afford very fancy, very expensive offerage education for their children. So you still have the kind of networking which still creates a elites in the status quo, something these guys disregard because Helena told, tells you there are other arbitrary criteria which also create inequality. This one is at least partially due to your efforts. So even a lot of the things which I do, to so take the most extreme Rawlsian point, even if most of my characteristics are ones which I was just born in, I still have to put the effort in order to create a certain amount of wealth. So at the very least, I have some degree of well, contribution to the wealth I have compared with things like beauty, gender, race, even if I... Uh, and, uh, gender, beauty, race, for the country you were born in. So the point is, comparatively, on our side, you have slightly less arbitrariness. 
But ultimately, the issue is that the richest people will always find ways and think about these things more, more long term. Not necessarily because they're smarter, we would disagree with that, but because they have more time to think about these things. Because they often have time to, type, to hire consultants who help them to allocate their wealth. Because often they think about what will happen in the future with their children because they simply have more time to think about it. So you don't get the children of the rich finally getting to middle class level. They will find ways to stay in upper classes. But people who are, say, aspiring middle class will not have the necessary capital in order for their own children to further, further advance in society. But ultimately, this also destroys the housing market at the moment when people who are private builders no longer have an incentive to build houses. Firstly, because most people will not buy them because of a deflationary pressure. You don't want to buy houses if you know that even more people will die tomorrow and you'll have an even bigger supply on the market, which ultimately means you get less housing, which is not only harmful because, well, people won't have their where to live, but also because of the things which I mentioned. The creation of necessary capital, i.e. the rise in the price of houses, which enables you to get capital in order to start businesses and advance through society. So you might create a classless society in, all, in which all people are stuck in the lower middle classes. As a great person once said, you would rather have the poor of poorer. Very proud to oppose. <laughs>
screen, more time my parents to do they can read me, enable me to get them to, to make that, that, kind of, kind of, that kind of competition between us two easier. So if it's like, at the moment, it's really impossible to move at all so in a socially mobile way, really smart how we can have the welfare and education things that would enable middle class people to make that jump more than happy. Just as a quick response to um, uh, the, like, the idea that people would give things. Notice gift tax exists. My grandfather gives me money so I can go to college. He can't give me any more than 3,000 euros a year, otherwise he'd be like, screw the gift tax. That would probably solve all those problems. Okay. State's role. Notice that essentially we do agree that on some level the state is here to facilitate our choice. We give it certain things, like, the, like I, I'm not allowed to do multiple things, like commit crimes or even do certain things in my body, or like there are lots of, lots of different things that I'm not allowed to do. But in return, and I pay taxes and stuff, but in return I do get things like an ability to choose, to like enhance my life in some meaningful way. But what we would say is notice that the problem with allowing people to accrue capital through inheritance often pops up specific and pernicious power relations that have existed throughout society. Notice the individual individuals who tend to hold capital and, and therefore they're the ones transferring the most through inheritance are people like white middle class people or white powerful people who have like had like, 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 like for instance, the Rothschilds for instance are still incredibly wealthy or other individuals literally for historical reasons even whether it's like literally your family or generally just being a white person you're more likely to have been able to abuse the system or to use the system that was built around you to make yourself wealthy like for instance the characterization of wasps in America white like Anglo, Anglo, Anglo um, Saxon Protestants Notice, at the point at which we can then transfer we just do wealth in a more like, better, we can transfer to the kind of minorities and individuals and people who wouldn't normally recruit capital, like as I said, minority people, let's say women for instance, and what happens, what the benefit of that is, is that oh, yeah. that allows us to give them the kind of education and the social welfare that would allow them to live their life out in a more meaningful way, but also notice, to compete with those power relations and maybe to change them. The ability of white people to like still control or be like the dominant like social grouping is because they've access to capital that can influence politics or do things like that, at the point at which we can inhibit that, we can make it a more level playing field. We think also that notice that capitalism has required us to screw over those minorities individuals to be the poor people that we sell things to, or to be the ones we extract surplus value for, for not for not very much. So we actually owe a specific duty to them, particularly to help them address that balance. Secondly, just like some point for that, notice also that at the point at which we are limiting the ability of these people to hold, I think sort of saying white wealthy people to hold capital, not, not all wealthy people, but some, hold capital. Notice that we also are less beholden to them. There will still be white billionaires who fund people, but notice for instance, the Koch brothers, for instance, in America, literally received like nearly $40 billion from their parents. They're able to completely skew the political spectrum for their own need. At the point at which you're not willing to take inherited wealth away from people, you're allowing those to hold an interest to skew the state for their interests and locking out the very people that we screw over with our capitalist system day after day. Why are not the, why all of those things that you're talking about cannot be solved with extreme radical redistribution during one's life and moderately high redistribution of their inheritance? No, because what we say is, is that ultimately we are happy to, elect, to enrich individuals who work really hard and gain these things and help the system. We're just not happy to help their kids who did absolutely nothing to gain that or to do those things. Now wealth. Notice the nature of the wealth we're talking about. It is things like houses, art, other things that aren't liquid. At the point at which you make them liquid, you could, because I'll like say with sell them periodically or whatever to gain like capital. Mm -hmm. you, you allow the state then to use that capital for really good macro, macroeconomic benefits. What we're talking about are things like being able to inject capital in, like, in crises that we've seen in recent years. Austerity wouldn't have been necessary, for instance, to screw like, the very poorest individuals. That enables them to have a much broader macroeconomic policy that deals with like lows in the economy, that lets us like, deal with the business cycle of ups and downs and probably smooth that out so as not to screw over the very poorest of society who are the ones who are hurt. But notice second, this is very, very important. Notice also that the moral claim that a person who has actually used their abilities to make men, that money have might be a good one. But it also, it might be a true moral claim, but also it's effective in that you're allowing the individual who's capable of accruing capital to accrue capital, tax on a reasonable amount. Their kids aren't necessarily the best people to be giving capital to. Well, like, we have a conception of property that is not just like, not just, um, and that it also like, allows like tax structure things to blame people to gain capital. So the point at which we ask people who are good at doing it, so we allow them to do it. But the point which you're giving their kids, who aren't necessarily the kind of people who are able to effectually push the economy forward, you're literally rewarding people who might be idiots and giving them all the wealth and when we might actually, so if you're comparing to the state's not very good, notice most of these kids might be horrendous. Just because your parents were sensible, you are too. We think we win that comparative. Happy to. Thank you, Member of Government, and I'm delighted to call upon the Member of Opposition.
And all this debate should not be judged about who most benefits the economy in the short term. This debate should not be judged about the housing market for a couple of reasons. Firstly, as Martin pointed out, it is likely that in the majority of cases, it's very easy to pass your house down to your child. So any of the harms and benefits in terms of the housing market are quite minimal and apply to a rare minority of cases. Secondly, there's hundreds of ways to regulate the housing market other than reducing the value of housing, forcing like, and thereby reducing the quality of housing, which is a harm that applies on proposition. This debate comes down to exactly the kind of metric that opening government and closing government have rested their entire principal case on, which is, does it actually improve social mobility? Does this actually lead to better outcomes in terms of redistribution? So far, opening opposition has said, no, inequality will remain. We tell you inequality gets worse. Before that, uh, a very quick point in terms of the principle of this debate. This should be really brief because it isn't what the debate comes down to. So proposition has said it's okay to take the money because you've like the state, you owe this to the state because you've benefited from it. As we pointed out, individuals have a right to their money and the state has already made a claim to it the first time that it was taxed, right? We say that money is bad. Money is good things that with which you can improve your life, right? If you've messed up the, 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 your time and your efforts into the state, you still have a claim to the things that improve your life, to things that you find meaningful. Those are things that can still affect others even after you pass away, such as your family, so that's important. When they say, well, you know, you can't benefit from it because you're dead and no one else can. That is false. We say your children can benefit from it or in fact are more entitled to it than the state who has already made a claim on it once. Why do we think this? Firstly, that is money that would have gone to them if that person had passed it on before dying. Secondly, that is time that the parents would have spent with their children if it wasn't time that they had spent working. So we say that children at the very least have a bigger entitlement than the state does. Closing government then says, no, this is a consequentialist thing, right? This is other people that we could benefit more. That is the entirety of our case, right? Where you actually don't improve redistribution and it actually gets worse. For Claims within this. Firstly, the money is still going to get passed on. It gets worse than uh, like you, the, the tax money will not help the poor. And fourthly, this harms the working class. So firstly, we say that you will still be passing on this money, right? That's something that opening up have also addressed. We say open, open government are right to point out that you have an incentive to want to help your kids, right? Um, however, we think that it is unlikely that you will do this by voting for social welfare policies. Firstly, because that's really uncertain, because you make a very minimal difference. You probably don't want to think your children will end up in welfare anyway. It is far more likely you will do it in a direct way, which is improving the situation of your children in the short term. How can you do this? Through trust funds, through like putting your house in their name, through things like investing in them in your lifetime, through education, through housing, through like all of the family benefits, right? The crucial thing here is, firstly, the response from closing up that, oh, there's gift taxes anyway that restrict that is minimal given that gift tax is in the vast majority of countries at the same level as the current inheritance tax, right? So there is a minimal, like, there is a minimal restriction on how much you can give away. No good proposition have never shown us at no point in this debate why inheritance tax is an actively worse way of, of like, imp improving inequality than these measures, right? What we're going to show you is that when parents invest money in their kids throughout their lifetime, that actually increases inequality much more than if you do it through, uh, through inheritance tax for four reasons. Firstly, no that inheritance tax actually leads to quite little entrenchment of wealth. The reason for this is that your parents, in most cases, pass away when you're around 40, 50 years old. At that point, you've already made a life for yourself. You've already probably accumulated quite a lot of wealth, and the inheritance money you get makes quite a small difference to you if you are in the upper class that they're concerned about. Secondly, what happens under our side of the house? Where parents, uh, sorry, on their side of the house, where parents are concerned about providing that safety net for their children that they are concerned about as they have, of the, uh, as they have conceded, without having the safety net of that inheritance tax. We say what you're likely to do is to ins in entrench the privilege that you have, to entrench this and solidify the institutions that entrench your social class, that entrench the privilege that you have, make your position so sticky and your child's position so sticky that no one else can climb up to compete with them, that, so that that safety net is there in place forever, right? What does this mean? Having things like more private schools buying better houses for them, like better universities, opposing social programs, things that mean that other kids will be competing with your kid for like the entire like first 40 years of their life. Thirdly, we say it is worse because very often these kinds of benefits come at a crucial point in the kids' lives. These benefits can come when they are 10 and go into a private school or a grammar school as opposed to like a, a public school, um, and they come when they're going to university, when they go to like Oxford as opposed to a different university and making their way for themselves. This is really important because it is at those crucial points when other people from other social classes could work really, really hard to compete with those kids, to make it for those their positions. Now they're completely out-competed, so you remove any possibility for a, like, for, for a like natural transition and the, of, and the like social mobility possibilities for people in lower classes. These are things that affect the entire life of these individuals from the point that they are five to the point that they die, not from the point that they are 40, like inheritance tax does as a tool. But fourthly, 
Look at also the main benefactors, the people that donate the most to things like scholarships, to charity, to social welfare schemes, are like the extremely wealthy, right? The reason they do this is that that is money that they have left over after they know that they have enough money in a safety net to go to their children through inheritance tax, right? That's money they don't need, that's money they're not going to use, they don't benefit from, therefore they donate it. Now, those donations are in direct competition to money they could use to entrench the position of their children rather than strengthening the position of others that will then compete with those children. So under the proposition, you know, give the richest people an incentive to stop donating to those things that actually make a huge difference for social mobility. For all of these reasons, these kind of donations are much, much worse than inheritance tax. Thirdly, why does the benefit that proposition want to talk to you about of having more tax money to help the poor not happen? We say that it is false that the obstacle to redistribution is that we don't have enough money. There is a huge amount of money we invest on a hu like, huge amount of things that is not social welfare. Things like the military, things like literally everything, right? We could tax people much, much more in the status quo than we do. The reason we don't have money to help the poor is therefore not that we have money which we could raise in thousands of ways. It is political cap it is like a shortage of political will. It's people that don't want that money to go to the poor. I'll explain why that's bad. But before that opening. Why under the status quo do wealthy individuals already have massive incentives to invest as much money as humanly possible into their child's education? Why would that change? Obviously, they, obviously they do, but I've already given you a lot of specific reasons why it gets worse. Just to emphasize, because under, your, under our side of the motion, they have that safety net anyway. They know if their child messes up and they're 40 years old, they'll have that back up. Now they don't, so you have to make sure that that never ever can happen, that they're never ever screwed. So. As I told you, the problem is not that you don't have enough money, the problem is political will. Not that that remains a problem, right? In fact, now you have more, a, a bigger lack of political will for helping the poor, because now the richest already feel more targeted than they do in the status quo. That means that they're more likely to oppose social welfare programs with the extra money that you have. They're likely to push for lowering other taxes because you're already taxing them so much more in this way. So you get no benefit whatsoever. Lastly, let's talk about the working class and how it gets worse. Opening opposition have said, that they need a house and that's good. We're, we're going to tell you whether the most important group and whether it's the most important benefit for them. Actually, whether the most important is obvious. They're a huge group of like working class, they're abandoned. Why is that the most important benefit for them? The crucial thing that they need is a big injection of cash or a big like investment benefit. Know that at no point do they have enough savings for like the economies of scale benefits that richer individuals are able to attain. Things like enough money and enough savings to make the one big investment of sending your kid to a good private school or a big university. Those are things that parents need in a one big investment of cash such as an inheritance such as a house that they can that can act as an investment this is a crucial benefit that only happens on our side i'm very proud to oppose this motion <laughs> Those are apparently important things. First, though, I'm beginning my rebuttal to uh, see. I'm going to say it's a bold, strategic choice to open your debate with a quite obvious knife. What I also said, you actually did two of them first. The first one was stating quite unequivocally that apparently housing is not an issue, insofar as OO pretty much states their entire case on housing being an issue. I'd say probably you should have rolled with that. But insofar as it, it isn't an issue, I'll talk about that in a second. Number two, the idea that because we have already taxed something, we are not, it is not permissible for us to tax something again. Note that at no point do they give you a reason that that reason why when a state does something once it is not entitled to do it a second time. Note specifically that in the context of taxes, we already do that all the time, insofar as we tax your income, and then we tax you when you buy things with sales tax, and we tax you by value added tax, a VAT, VAT. So please, you, you really needed to give us a principal reason why it is why, why, why the state's not entitled to do that several times. Number two, also note that like they kind of mischaracterize what money is. She kind of states flippantly that money is equivalent to the time that you did not spend with your kids because you were accruing it. We've already told you that often the money and the money that we care about is not accrued by individuals through work because they spent their time working in an office somewhere. Often it's literally handed to them. See the fact that this is a debate about inheritance. This is about paying from your grandparents through your parents to you. Specifically this is true in the most important of cases, in the largest amount of money. At that point, also you didn't prove that uh, kids have an entitlement to their parents' time. No, I'm going to say intuitively true. <laughs> still. Okay, three, trust law. They say that now we're just going to push all of your money 
uh, all of your money into assets, for example, or, or, or put things on trust for your kids. Note that that is specifically why we have entire systems of law that can specifically trace into assets that we think that you are taking away from the state illegally. For example, you can you can trace into sham trusts, which I when, for example, I say I'm putting money on trust for Owen, but the state knows it's not really on trust for Owen, it's just for me. At that point, the state's entitled to trace into that. Once we have set up a system whereby you are not entitled to pass money on to your kids when you're dead, I'm going to posit that we will extend that sham trust to the idea that you are just doing this in order to circumvent our inheritance law, so not an issue. Finally, oh sorry, not finally, another contention with OO though, is when, they, when OO say, for example, that including that's incredibly important, not only for the middle class, but for people who want to become middle class, is having capital with which they can set up money, or with which they can set, which they can set up companies, for example, or businesses. Note, and we think that they're correct when they say that actually this money tends to accrue to age 40, at the point at which already your life is set out. Most people do not set up businesses when they are 45. If that is true, then one of you is wrong. Uh, probably one of you should have clarified that, but in any case. Fifthly, though, note that their point about, about parents now pushing for the best possible lives for their kids is entirely non-comparative. Why? Because in the status quo, note that the reason that places like Eaton exist, for example, is specifically because rich parents already try to endow their kids with as many benefits as possible. It is unclear that that is something benefit that happens exclusively on our side of the house and not on theirs. But what's the comparative? The comparative is on our side. We have not only more money in the state's hands, we have more liquid money that we can specifically pump into welfare programs. So now, specifically producing better outcomes for disprivileged children by giving them better educations, by giving them better schools. So even if Eaton continues to exist, we have better one comprehensive as well. I think that those are UK terms, but in any case. Okay, so let's talk about the state. Ultimately, the state comes into being to protect individuals. That's why it is legitimate. That is why we support it. Not that we already specifically restrict the things that you can do with your bodily autonomy, the things that you can do with yourself as an individual, insofar as it harms other people. That's why I ask, uh, also because I like asking philosophically complex questions, that's why I ask, for example, why it is the case that I'm not entitled to beat you up and take your money, even though that would be in my self-interest and I would be using my money to do that. They tell you because of the harm principle. You're entitled to do things insofar as they do not harm other individuals. Note at, at, at every point in the government, we tell you specifically when you hoard money, when you take money, no thank you. That isn't necessarily yours insofar as your grandparents probably got it from exploiting a poor person's grandparents. That is probably a continuation of a theft. It's probably a continuation of you specifically harming another individual. At that point, no distinction is made. I will say that the state is a bad actor. Note that this is again entirely non comparative insofar as they have to compare it to the actor or the individual making the distribution instead. The reason they say that the state is a bad actor is because it is self interested. I'm going to go out on a limb and say that individuals are even more so self interested insofar as they are individuals with like three or four kids or actually 2.5 kids when you're at the riches. Whereas the state, as long as it is self interested, has a larger purview of people to be self interested in for the, to the benefit of. That means that even if it is true that the state is self interested, even that the individual is too, at least we can harness the state's self-interest for the benefit of, of more people. No, thank you. So oh yeah, that's, that's why I can't use my body to actually harm other people. Like ultimately, the state's interest is, is, is not served. Oh yeah, okay. So the state's interest is better served when it is capable of acting for the largest amount of people possible. That is why you actively restrict other people's ability to harm individuals. Note that when the state is specifically beholden to certain groups because they accrue wealth, and because, uh, because wealth and privilege is attached to them, the state is limiting its own ability to act, is limiting the policies it can implement, is limiting the policies it can create. Because at the point to which so many individuals have all the power because they have financial capital, they are the ones capable of dictating what you can do. The state should not make itself beholden to that. Oh, yeah. Okay, so we told you that working class families who gain an inheritance can invest that money in businesses, but more importantly in the education of their children. How do you get that cash injection on your side of the house? Because we are capable of taking the assets of richer people, selling them, realizing that liquid, uh, those liquid assets and putting them into education programs. That's been very clear the, the, like, like in our case. Importantly though, note that the system, no, that was an answer. Note that the system of capitalism is one that is absolutely predicated on screwing over the few. Because in order to have job competition, you have to have some people who are always losing out. That means that the state is actively benefiting from capitalism. It has to realize the duty to the people who it is continually screwing over. So let's talk about the economy. Note, you increase the ability to stimulate the economy better at the point at which you can sell off the, 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 uh, the, the Rothschilds paintings and use that money to do the kind of products, uh, projects that you want to do. Like the stuff about the housing, like house prices, I think has been dealt with. But note that if it is true that like house prices crashes, then, it, then all of their other harms melt away in so far as even that people will still have to live somewhere in the state now owns property, can rent it out at prices to people. Property housing actually becomes more affordable because the state didn't have to use any money to acquire that house which means that it doesn't have 
have to offset that debt, which means you could probably rent it out actually cheaper than private people could. So we think that it's actually highly inefficient. Like, like that, 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 that the current system of inheritance is highly inefficient because it specifically locks out like, like talented people. We allow people to accrue capital within their lives insofar as they are good at it. And in being good at it, we are able to tax them and produce goods for other people. When they pass it to their kids, that is not necessarily true because talent is not a vertical identity. It is a horizontal one and it occurs disparate throughout the population. Look, social capital, those are traits that are linked to wealth. Whiteness is linked to wealth, beauty is constructed around the idea of wealth, so those things also melt away. You get more money for people who we owe a new duty to, that's why you're quite happy to propose. We thank the government for a speech and to conclude the case for the closing opposition, this debate and the winner around the Cheeriest actually was when you were the last speech of the day. <laughs> Please observe a couple of things for the purpose of this debate. Like, is it probably true that some money will be taken from some people? The scope is a little bit unclear. We say it's probably going to be taken more from the poorer people who aren't able to reallocate their wealth to a greater extent. But there probably could be some rich people who also have that money taken away from them. However, that balance still will fall on our side of the house. Note as well that we think that it is there's probably some impact on the economy, but given that the economy is predominantly impacted by things like, you know, trade and if people are working and lots of these things, where well, the impact might exist, it is probably not the most important impact in this debate. That's why it's an issue of scope, not necessarily a knife. We think that's valuable material for the opposition. It's just not the most important material for this debate. Um, I'm going to talk to you, first of all, about the principle. I'm also going to talk to you about why, like, redistribution actually gets worse on the other side of the house. Before that, I'm just going to deal, re, re, deal really briefly with like the additional mech that we got in the last speech, or like how we can probably like, trace down like sham trust and like fake giving and so on. Like we presumably think, first of all, that's a massive betrayal of the principle they stand by, where they're happy to allow people to distribute their money as they like while they're alive. So probably like, they probably want people to be able to give money at some point. Probably also breaks down the economy entirely when everyone's going to be following every possible gift. They probably have to be sufficiently generous to us to allow that the fact that people can possibly give money and give assets. It's probably also the case that in as much as there are obstacles to that, rich people are often very good at putting around those obstacles. So if they're putting obstacles in the way of that extra mech, it's probably disproportionately going to harm the poorer and disproportionately benefit the richer. So let's talk briefly about the principle. There's been a lot of banding around, right? And one of the claims is we got from the last speaker that hasn't been dealt with by Olivia, because Olivia just dealt with everything else, is the idea that, like, you know, double tax somehow is done in other parts of society. I mean, that might be true to some extent, but the problem is we tax it in different areas and it's something that serves different functions in society. But the point is, once a particular amount of money has been taxed and you don't want to use it with something else, and you, the state has got its share of that part of your capital, the state then sees it, it, its claim on that. But secondly, more importantly, the, I think the big contention here is whether the children or the state have the biggest right to this money. And we have claimed children have a right to this money because some part of this money probably was taken from them like in terms of time or in terms of otherwise given them. They say the state as a society probably has a claim because like, you know, the state has probably contributed. Both of those are probably really true. That means it would be a good thing to share that money at the point that someone dies so that part of it goes to children and part of it goes to the state. That doesn't happen with a 100% inheritance tax. Then all of it goes to the state and it probably is a principally wrong thing to do. However, as Olivia very clearly has pointed out, and um, most people seem to agree, which is also very nice, the main thing we want to achieve with any kind of tax, and therefore the main thing we want to achieve in this room, is better redistribution. The first claim we get in terms of redistribution is a very simplistic idea that much more money makes much more redistribution, right? Like, Olivia asked and gives several reasons why that just not is the case. Like, like if that were true, there are lots of ways that states can get more money. Like we can borrow money on the international market, we can raise taxes, we can just reallocate money from like military or for like 
other things and just push it into those areas. It's not sufficient to say that the money that we accrue that we accrue through this particular model, because we even if it's true that they do accrue some money through this model, is going to go directly to these kind of welfare programs. But even if part of it does, because like met, let's say that politicians are able to go, well, you know, we raise this money for a particular reason, we're going to earmark it a little bit, going to go to that. It's still unclear whether that marginal difference one has trickled down to all of society, it's going to affect any kind of social mobility. It might make like leave people with a small marginal like in a small marginal amount of money in their in their pocket but give like note that there's a big group of people who are poor and they probably have like varying incomes that doesn't mean that they're able to break out of that thing this thing that allows people to break out of poverty and systemic poverty is not a little bit more money that comes from the state the ability to make a big leap by having accruing like additional money no thank you that's where Olivia's analysis about why poor people, or whether the working class needs this really much, becomes very important. You know, just, like, what she brings uniquely, the mechanism that's missing from open opposition, is the fact that when you only have a small net income, in other words, when your expenses to such a great extent exceeds or at least equals your income, you'll never be able to save the amount of money that you need. That's why this particular mechanism is so important, because you need the kind of generational aggregation of money to be able to go to invest in that really important education, or that really important like business venture, whatever you think you need to do. No, thank you. Um, but then we get the, the, the other response to the claim that the... Um, that there isn't going to be very much money that trickles down. They say, oh, well, this is just going to normalize. We're not actually going to see the rich people pass on money to their children because the norms normalize, so after a while, people just accept that this is the way society is going to work. We just don't buy that claim. First of all, because there's no reason why that's going to happen. Secondly, because their entire case rests on the fact that the upper class do different things than other people and they have different priorities because they want to preserve their prior their privilege. Like, even if that if it were the case, like Maybe if we did this behind the veil of ignorance, this would happen. The fact that people have a memory of that they have had privilege and they would be seeking to preserve that, they would appear pass on the method for the preserve that to their children, it's only when this will ever normalize when people can have real benefit from always trying to avoid this. So they're always trying to pa pass on their houses to their children, or they always try to invest in education or whatever before they die. I'll take your point. Allowing the rich to hoard money in the way that we do allows them to have the political power to put barriers in place of social mobility for the reasons that you tell us that they want. You don't get social so first of all, know that passing that money on to your children early gives them the tools to uh, like enact like to block those kind of uh, that, 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 those those kind of policies. So, like it isn't. It's never clear to me why it's important for the oldest person in the generation to have that extra money to like uh, to go against social change. But Olivia gives you a specific reason for why this becomes worse, and we get less social mobility uh, programs. She gives you two reasons. The first reason for that is that you lose the security for your children. If you don't know for sure that you're going to be able to pass money to your children, you're not in your lifetime going to feel sure that the amount you've given is enough. So you're going to invest as much money as possible to have safeguards that your children will have something. You don't need to do that when you know you're going to be able to pass on a substantial amount. That means that you never going to, you're never in less cases going to feel that you're going to be able to take that money and pass it into like social mobility schemes or other like other really important things. Secondly, but then you're just going to do it earlier, so you're going to do it at a point where the ch where the actual harm to the institution is the biggest, and that is in the case of like, people's education and so on. So both in both of the cases, we see that we see, we make the incentives for rich people significantly worse. At the end of the day, we just think that rich people are probably going to be rich anyway. But when we allow, when we give rich people a threat to their money, and we force them to to like um, to yeah. To, to not, uh, yeah, I'm um, happy to oppose. <laughs>